Hey, I'm Mac. Welcome back to my channel. As always, if you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe. Consider joining my Patreon to get access to videos 12 to 24 hours early. Today, we're coming back to examine the multi-level marketing exogenous ketone supplement company Prove It Ventures for part two in this multi-part deep dive on Prove It. <laughs> Today, we're going to take a break from the business and executive drama swirling around this company and its uh, founders. <laughs> and instead, we're going to examine the products and the claims made about them. First, I will introduce a few concepts that I consider to be extremely important when we're evaluating a health or medical claim and the evidence provided to back it up generally before we get into anything specific to prove it so that we can apply those concepts as we're trying to decide on the credibility of Prove It's claims. We're also going to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of the background and terms associated with this keto diet, exogenous ketone space. It's gonna be best if we go over that before we let Prove It start blowing their hot air into our potato chip bag of knowledge, okay? Then we will look at the materials Prove It provides on the general metabolic functions relevant and assess the accuracy of Prove It's and other keto evangelists and supplement purveyors information about the biological processes in general. Then we will examine the problems they claim their products can solve and the evidence they provide, as well as assess if the way they are applying that evidence is appropriate. So let's begin with evaluating claims and we'll start with evidence. This might seem obvious, but the first thing we should consider when a health claim is made should be to clarify what the claim actually is, because Sometimes it's very easy to lose track of what specifically is being claimed. And if we don't know what the claim actually is, then it's going to be quite difficult to evaluate if it's supported by evidence or not. A common framework we used in pharmacy school is creating a PICO question. Uh, P stands for patient. So it could be healthy 18 to 40 year olds or 18 to 25 year old women taking oral contraceptives or men over 60 with a family history of prostate cancer, etc. Who are we talking about? It can be a general category of people or it could be a very specific group of people, but either way, it should be clear who it is that this claim applies to. The I stands for intervention. What is the intervention the claim is being made about? For example, um, once daily Zestrel, 10 milligrams, or 30 minutes of vigorous exercise daily, or, or reduction of carbohydrate intake by 50%. What specific intervention are we talking about with this claim? The C stands for comparison. We're talking about the intervention as opposed to what? The comparison could just be not the intervention. For example, if the intervention is a reduction in carb intake by 50%, the comparison could be leaving the diet unchanged, or the comparison could be to another intervention, such as if we're talking about Zestrel 10 milligrams daily, we could compare to another medication that is in the same kind of ca category. And then the O stands for outcome. What specifically is being claimed as an outcome of the intervention in question? For example, it could be reduced mortality from heart disease or improvements in A1C levels. And then you could put it all together to make a PICO question. For example, in patients 18 to 60 years old with diagnosed type 2 diabetes, not on insulin therapy, with an A1C of 9%, does fluparin 25 milligrams reduce A1C more than glucophage? This framework clearly establishes the question we are going to be expected the provided evidence to answer. This is important because it is quite common for people to make a claim and then try to back it up with evidence that supports a kind of related question, but not actually the question we were looking to get answered. And I'm not saying this is all like something that you should memorize and apply every day. I'm just trying to get us into the the critical headspace for how to be skeptical of shit like this in the in the health and medical space. Uh, next, I would like to introduce the concept of patient oriented outcomes. It is very important when looking at and considering outcomes, especially when they're being presented as evidence for why you should do something, 
Think about whether the outcome is a patient-oriented outcome or a disease-oriented outcome. This is different from the similar term patient-centered outcome, which is a related concept, but that concept applies to rating and assessing healthcare providers and organization qualities. Like how well does a hospital do with the goals that were most important to patients? We're talking about the evaluation of research and evidence and whether the research and evidence is focusing on what is most directly related to a patient's experience. For example, blood pressure is a disease-oriented outcome. The reason so much medical practice and research focuses on blood pressure is because there is very strong evidence that high blood pressure increases the probability of things like heart attack and stroke, which are patient-oriented outcomes. High blood pressure itself does not have any direct negative impact on your experience in day-to-day -day life. You're, you're not like, oh my god, I feel terrible because my blood pressure is so high today. Someone doesn't take a blood pressure medication because their blood pressure is just making them miserable. <laughs> they take it because we have evidence that high blood pressure increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. This is an important concept when evaluating evidence because it's very easy to get hung up on a disease-oriented outcome and forget that the disease-oriented outcome alone is not necessarily a compelling case for the intervention. If a new blood pressure drug is being submitted for approval and it is shown to lower blood pressure by 15 points, but the patients taking it had the same risk of heart disease and stroke and mortality from those events, there doesn't seem to be much of a case for using <laughs> this new drug as opposed to one of the many blood pressure medications that actually have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, hospitalization, cardiovascular associated mortality. Next thing I look at with when I'm evaluating evidence is the species. Okay, this might sound obvious, but when someone is presenting you with a study to serve as evidence for the claim they're making, a rat study is totally irrelevant because humans are not rats. The fact that some rats in a carefully controlled laboratory environment took a study drug and exhibited XYZ effects is not even close to the level of evidence you should have before putting an untested compound in your body or starting an extremely restrictive diet. You, you would think this would go without saying, but it is ridiculously common to see companies in the nutritional supplement space citing rat or mouse studies as evidence of the beneficial effects of their products. S seriously, think about it. If something working out for rats is ample evidence that you should do it too, then why are you paying rent or a mortgage when you could just live in the subway? Have you ever worked an overnight job? I've worked two in my careers. And I gotta say, the rats really make the whole being nocturnal thing look easy. It's, it's almost like their systems are, are wired differently from ours. The purpose of mouse and rat studies is to identify potential areas for future research and possibly for human trials. They are not meant to be taken as evidence that you should use whatever new compound they tested. I know it is commonly stated that rats and mice have similar biology to humans, but when they say that, they mean as opposed to like flatworms or fruit flies. There are so many keto words being spewed out by people who know approximately nothing about what they're talking about or, or what ketones even are these days that you'd almost think keto was a cryptocurrency or blockchain or the dark web or one of those other things that are mainly discussed by people who don't know what they're talking about, or so it would seem based on how many people don't understand that it is a waste of money to pay for dark web monitoring. Like, <laughs> what are they going to do? 
demand that your information stop being sold right next to methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, and illegal firearms. <laughs> also, do you seriously think that there are people on the dark web giving out real, meaning extraordinarily valuable to a fraudster, personal and financial profile information of people for free? Jesus Christ, use your brain. So, so how exactly is Experian going to know your information is being sold unless they're just on every Silk Road clone buying every single pack of personal data to check if you're in it? And, and then what are they going to do if they find it? Anyway, that was a little tangent. <laughs> so let's begin with the term where all of this comes from. What is a ketone? A ketone is an organic chemistry term that describes a molecule that has a carbon atom double bonded to an oxygen atom with carbon chains on either side. The related medical term and the topic we're specifically talking about in this case is ketone bodies, which refers to three specific molecules, um, only two of which are technically ketones, which is why PhDs and people with professional degrees like PharmDs and MDs will never get along because I know it's not actually a ketone, Derek. I'm just using a medical term because some of us aren't in the lab. Some of us are out here doing things that actually matter. Okay, thank you. In the body, when blood glucose levels drop, fat cells with considerable reluctance begin to release fatty acids into the bloodstream to be used as an energy source. All cells can use fatty acids as an energy source and will gradually switch over as glucose becomes more scarce, except for red blood cells because they don't have the necessary machinery for processing fatty acids, and the central nervous system won't either because fatty acids cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, and the heart won't switch because the heart always runs on fat, not glucose, which is kind of poetic, isn't it? The liver has an additional job that it does with the fatty acids. It turns some of them into glucose precursors that it can combine with amino acids to turn into new glucose. And it releases the leftovers into the bloodstream as acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, which are the ketone bodies. And those can be used by all cells except for red blood cells as energy and, importantly, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and feed the central nervous system, which will use them while it continues complaining that it's out of glucose. <laughs> this process is called ketogenesis. The state of elevated ketone bodies in the blood is called ketosis, not to be confused with the similar term ketoacidosis, which is an extreme state of uncontrolled ketone body production, leading to a drop in your blood pH level which is usually caused by a lack of insulin, most commonly in type 1 diabetes, and that is a medical emergency, unlike ketosis. The term ketogenic diet generally refers to a high-fat, adequate protein, low-carbohydrate diet that forces the body to burn fats rather than carbohydrates, which, as we just went over, causes the liver to eventually release ketone bodies. While recently the keto diet has become trendy for weight loss purposes, the ketogenic diet was actually initially developed in the 1920s as a medical therapy for pediatric epilepsy, and it reduces seizures by about 50% for half the children who try it, and by over 90% for about one-third of the children who try it. Its popularity has decreased a lot over the years, however, as newer, more effective anticonvulsant medications have become more readily available with a lot fewer side effects than older drugs had. So it definitely has some dramatic effects, especially neurologically, at least in epilepsy. It also is effective for some people for weight loss, and some people report that they feel less hungry on a ketogenic diet. Because the ketogenic diet causes an increase in fat metabolism, it's frequently employed by bodybuilders like Dave Hollis to drop fat quickly in a short time frame. 
Finally, there's preliminary evidence suggesting that it may have some benefit with progressive neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease, but that needs to be confirmed with further study. All of that sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> Seems like some nice benefits. Burning fat by eating more fat all while potentially improving cognitive performance. Sweet, right? Yeah, all of that is great in theory. <laughs> the problem is that it is an extremely difficult diet to maintain, and it's not something that you can really cheat with because ketosis is, a, is kind of a binary thing. You're either in it or you're not. If, if you are following a true ketogenic diet and not just a low carb diet, you cannot have anything with added sugar, breads, cereals, pasta, rice, cookies, potatoes, corn, squash, peanuts, almost all fruits, beans, wines, or beers. Yeah, that's why it was only popular as an epilepsy treatment. And even for epilepsy, it was only popular until more tolerable anticonvulsant medications became available because that sucks. Furthermore, the best diet is one that you can stick to indefinitely, as in not a fad diet. The best diet is making changes to your habits that you can live with. So let's summarize and be absolutely clear on what each of these similar sounding terms means. So we have ketones, or more correctly, ketone bodies, which are produced by the liver when blood sugar is low and fat is being metabolized. We have ketosis, which means elevated blood levels of ketone bodies, regardless of why ketones are elevated. And next, we have ketogenic diet, which refers to a restrictive, high-fat, adequate protein, very low-carbohydrate diet that leads to a consistent state of ketosis. That finally brings us to the product that serves as prove its money laundering mechanism to avoid being an illegal pyramid scheme, exogenous ketones. Exogenous just means that they were taken as a supplement rather than being naturally produced by the body. Wouldn't it be nice to receive all those wonderful benefits of the ketogenic diet without actually having to maintain a ketogenic diet? What could possibly go wrong with this concept? This is sure to be effective and well supported because everything always goes really well when diet culture latches on to one ingredient or compound or macronutrient and just ignores everything else and all the context. That always goes like really, really, really well. But you know what? I think I've said enough at this point. And you know how I love to have these people explain their products to us in their own words. After all, we're way too fucking stupid to understand this shit. I mean, are you smart enough to have founded Ripplin? Right, exactly, exactly. So we're going to watch the video that Prove It has on the page for their primary altruistic blessing to the world of a product known as Keto OS. And then afterward, we'll see who lost the most brain cells. Okay? All right, let's go. Let's go! I got a new 50 millimeter lens. Got a 1.4 aperture. Mm. Blur my background, daddy. Have you ever built a campfire before? If so, did you know that by building that fire, you've actually unlocked the power for unlimited energy, fat loss, and focus? Let me explain. When you build a campfire, there are three types of fuel that you can use. Kindling, logs, and coal. Now, the kindling is the easiest to catch on fire. It burns fast, and if you're not careful, it'll be gone before the larger logs even catch on fire. The logs take a little bit longer to catch on fire, but if you're able to burn them correctly, eventually they will catch the coals on fire and give you a nice long heat that will keep you warm throughout the night. So how does knowing that give you unlimited energy, fat loss, and focus? Well, did you know that there are also three types of fuel that run your body? Carbs, proteins, and fats. And each one works differently inside of you. 
The first is carbs. Yes, we love them, and yes, we crave them. And as soon as we start to eat them, we get an instant burst of energy. But unfortunately, it doesn't last long, and we're left with a crash and a constant craving for more. The next, we shift to the proteins, the building blocks for our muscles. But also, they can actually be the barrier that keeps us from losing fat. And then there is the last and the best source of fuel. We call this source fat. And like the coal, if you can catch it on fire, it'll give you the longest and the best source of energy. But for most people, it's almost impossible to get to a state where they can actually burn fat. Now, this is a state we call ketosis. So why is it so hard? Well, it starts with the kindling or the carbs. We eat some, but they quickly burn off, causing our energy to drop and giving us cravings for more. We can keep throwing these sticks on the fire, but they will burn fast and never give us the consistent warmth or energy that we need. When you start to add proteins to this fire, your body can burn these logs and fuel a little bit longer, yet it still doesn't compare to what happens when you get your body to a state where it can actually burn fat. So why do we want to burn fats? Well, a few reasons. Common sense says that burning fats, well, it helps us lose fat. <laughs> and he's right. But on top of that, when you get to a state where you're burning pure fats, they release ketones into your body. And these little ketones are like thousands of little motivational speakers running through your body. They give you energy, they give you focus, they make you feel incredible, and yes, they make the fat melt off your body because it's finally being burned off. It's no longer being guarded by the carbs and the proteins. All right, first I'm gonna need to pause it right here before we go into the problem and solution Priva is gonna propose here. Some of what they're saying is somewhat accurate, but some of it is misguided or a smidge misleading. <laughs> the statement about carbohydrates being quick kindling is true of simple carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates are sugars, such as table sugar, fructose, and glucose. They're absorbed and burned quickly, and the energy from them lasts a short burst because they are metabolized and stored so quickly, usually in under an hour. This is not an accurate representation, however, for complex carbohydrates, like what you would get from starchy foods like potatoes, vegetables, whole grains, etc. Those carbohydrates are made of long chains of sugar molecules that break down slowly over several hours. Furthermore, it's not like the body has no strategy mitigating this. <laughs> The liver produces glycogen, which is the animal analog of starch in plants, which is long chains of sugar for future use. And when enough carbohydrates are absorbed that some of them can be stored, it can create glycogen and release it as needed. Second point, second point is about where it said that the state where you burn fat is called ketosis. This is inaccurate. We went over this. Ketosis simply refers to elevated levels of ketone bodies in the blood. It typically, under normal conditions, occurs as a result of fat being metabolized, but ketosis refers to elevated blood ketone bodies, regardless of the cause or origin. It is so important with this topic and material to make sure we're absolutely clear and precise on this terminology because it's very easy to overlook critical distinctions and then you're off completely on the wrong track because of an inaccurate or unclear definition. Think through the carbs and the proteins and into the fats is so important, then why are we doing it each day? Well, the answer is because it's hard. To get our best fuel source and start burning fats and releasing ketones, the average person will have to work out 10 times harder and longer than they are now. They've got to burn through all of their carbs and all of their proteins, and then, and only then, will they finally hit their fat. Palatine bars have burned up all your carbs, and now your body's just running on water. But once the water's gone, then you'll be all muscle. It explains it all on the label. Yet that's where the magic happens. But even for the most extreme people who have learned to biohack their own bodies to get into a state of ketosis, it can often take weeks or months to even get there. But when they're in that state, they're on. Perfect energy, perfect focus, and perfect fat loss. It's kind of like playing the game Pac-Man, where most of the game you spend running away from the ghosts. But every once in a while, Pac-Man will eat one of those power pellets and everything suddenly changes. Instead of running away from the ghosts, you're on fire and you start actually chasing the ghosts. And the game becomes yours for the taking. That's how it feels when you're in ketosis. Life literally becomes yours for the taking. It's sad, but most people spend their whole life like Pac-Man at the beginning of the game, trying to stay safe and secure. Not even knowing that the power pellets exist. Not knowing what it's like to be on. Now, as I'm sure you can tell, having these ketones in your blood is the goal. 
how do we get there without spending weeks or months buying? Uh, first of all, did you catch that right there? Where the definition and concepts are getting slippery. Is the goal to get ketones into your blood? Or was the goal to burn fat? Because those could be very different goals. Having ketones in your blood does not promote or cause fat metabolism. It is the result of it. Also, I have no idea where this 10 times harder thing is coming from. Uh, but if you're ever trying to make up for what's coming in by exercising, that's not going to work generally. Okay, like running three miles is like a fun sized bag of Cheetos. <laughs> You're going to need to adjust your diet habits, not your exercise regime if you're looking for like weight benefits or whatever. Like exercise because it's fucking good for you, okay? Like if you're exercising for like just for weight loss, like it's a bad reason. On this whole why doesn't everybody do it every day? Um actually, you might already do ketosis every day. In fact, um I don't eat breakfast, which I know is shocking because one of the most successful marketing campaigns of the 20th century drilled in that it's the most important meal of the day. Uh, but just because a marketing campaign to sell sugar puff cereal or whatever says something doesn't make it true. And because I skip breakfast, I'm probably in ketosis like until lunch. Does this mean I'm getting the supposed ketogenic diet benefits? No. One, it's unclear if they really exist other than the possible neurological benefits in epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. And two, the whole thing about the ketogenic diet is that you're maintaining ketosis even after meals by adhering to a very strict, high fat, adequate protein, very low carbohydrate diet. The key is that it keeps you from coming out of ketosis. Now, Based on this video so far, you must be thinking, well, how can it be that I'm in ketosis on a daily basis when I don't have three physically gratifying orgasms without even touching myself before lunch from all the ketones in my blood? Well, that's because ketone bodies are just a fuel source that can supply the brain when blood sugar is low, okay? They're not fucking magic. Now, come on. Also, I'm going to go ahead and put down thousands of little motivational speakers as a pretty compelling reason to avoid ever being in ketosis. I'm just saying. How hacking our way into ketosis? Well, that's the question we asked ourselves a few years ago. And at first, it seemed like an impossible question. But recently, some scientists we work with have stumbled upon a new formula that actually made it possible. We call this new formula the Ketone Operating System, or Keto OS for short. Within just 60 minutes of taking it, your body almost instantly goes into ketosis. Check out how this works. Before Keto OS, they're not in ketosis. Within less than 60 minutes after taking Keto OS, your body is in nutritional ketosis. Isn't that awesome? Don't just take our word for it. Get your Keto OS now and do the test and prove it to yourself. After you do, you'll discover a few things. First, Keto OS is the best tasting health drink that you've ever had. Second, you'll see your body almost instantly go into nutritional ketosis. And third, you'll almost instantly feel what world-class athletes and biohackers spend weeks trying to accomplish. Your body will be in nutritional ketosis, and you'll get all the benefits that come with that. Increased fat loss, more mental clarity and focus, tons of extra energy. So do you want to experience what it feels like to be in ketosis? If so, then get your Keto OS now and find out what it feels like to unlock your energy, fat loss, and focus. Jesus Christ. So dumb. So dumb. Okay, first of all, Keto OS is one of the dumbest, most inane product names I've ever heard. How is it an operating system? It doesn't even work as a metaphor. It's, it's just a ketone supplement, for the love of God. What do they mean by that? Does that mean that like if I start running Keto OS, all my apps won't work anymore? Like, what? Anyway, see, here we have the big failure in understanding clearly presented that you drink this fucking concoction of ketone bodies and ketone body precursors, and wow, amazing, 60 minutes later, you're in ketosis, incredible. But wait a minute, 
isn't ketosis just elevated levels of ketone bodies in the bloodstream? Uh, yeah, it is. So you drink this thing that has a bunch of ketone bodies and their precursors in it, and then you have elevated ketone levels in your bloodstream. Yeah, 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 of course your ketone butt levels are elevated after you've just consumed something containing them. However, that doesn't change anything about the metabolic processes going on in the body. If glucose is available, the body is going to use it, especially the brain. The brain is very picky about that. No matter how many ketones are in your bloodstream from your keto OS drink, your body is going to use glucose if it is available and if protein is available, it's going to convert that into glucose and it's going to use all of that before it starts burning fat. This is a completely ass backwards approach. Ketone bodies do not cause fats to be metabolized. It is the other way around. The fact that your ketone drink causes elevated ketone levels is totally irrelevant. Oh, oh, except for one thing. I think we are all fairly familiar with the concept that when you take something or eat something, the body responds by countering that system to bring it back into balance. You know, if you drink a lot of caffeine, which is an adenosine receptor antagonist, meaning it blocks the receptor, your body responds by increasing the number of adenosine receptors to compensate for the amount being blocked by caffeine on a regular basis. If you use anabolic steroids like testosterone, your body responds by producing less testosterone. If you drink too many vodka LaCroix, your body responds by releasing less of the neurotransmitter GABA, which leads you to drinking more to compensate and then eventually causes toilet gait. So if you're constantly filling up your bloodstream with your prove it ketones, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to cause the liver to downregulate any ketone production because the levels are already high. How would it reduce ketone body production? Um, by avoiding fat metabolism. A ketone supplement is not going to make you burn more fat. If anything, it will make you burn even less. The reason the body isn't normally running on ketones is not just because there are none present. It's also because most tissues, including the brain, strongly prefer glucose and will use glucose before anything else if it's available, except your heart. The heart always burns fat. And this is how their entire evidence strategy falls apart. Right out of the gate, their claim that they can prove it is based on a urine test that shows increased ketone levels in the urine after consumption of a ketone supplement. God. This is what I'm talking about with patient-oriented outcomes versus disease-oriented. The point we care about is really not the blood ketone levels. The thing we're looking for is the claimed weight loss, diet, and cognitive benefits. A urine test showing elevated ketones is not evidence of any of those things. This is the basis of all the studies on humans they cite. The elevated levels of ketones. This is unpersuasive. If your drink is effective, show me even a single study with patient-oriented outcomes. Show me one study that demonstrates weight loss or cognitive benefits because that's what we want. The exogenous ketones aren't all that is in the Prove It Keto OS. I know, how can they possibly fit anything else into the stuff when there's already so much amazing in it? Okay, well, they are really doing some special things over there at Prove It and the other big ingredient they're claiming to bless us with is their Rapid Repair CMED 100 registered trademark. Prove It says, Keto OS contains ingredients proven to have a 
beneficial impact on healthy cell function, DNA repair, and increased amino acid production. Pruvit's CMED100 contains cat's claw, also known as Uncaria tomentosa. Oh, sh shit. That spell just turned one of my plants into a kitten. Hang on. Which has been shown to provide benefit to the body's natural ability to repair DNA. Aqueous extracts have also indicated additional neuroprotective and anti-aging benefits. Scientific studies indicate an enhanced ability to produce critically important proteins needed for optimal health. Cat's claw has been used by South American natives in the Amazon jungle for its therapeutic purposes. <laughs> well, then say no more. Um, I always say if it's used by South American natives in the Amazon jungle for its therapeutic properties, literally inject me full of it right now. Now, as a total hater who failed at network marketing, who trusts facts and needs evidence before believing something, I was like, sweet, you said it had scientific studies. Let's see them. So I clicked the link and, um, oh dear. Um, let me, let me just quickly review the citations here. So this one is a Petri dish. This one is in rats, rats. Petri dish. Oh, in this fifth one, they looked at the immune response from the pneumococcal vaccine at one month and at five months, and they compared patients who received CMED100 versus control, and they claimed that CMED100 improved the persistence of the response, except at both one month and at five months, the control group had a stronger response. But at one month, the control group was dramatically higher response. And at five months, it was still much higher, but not as dramatic a difference as it was at one month. And, and so they're saying that CMED100 is good because that group had a smaller drop in response from one month to five, even though the response was shittier both times. So that's, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I signed me up great. Uh, this next one had 17 mammal species, none of which were humans. Uh, this next one was not even a research study. This next one is literally about chiropractors. Uh, this next one is on mice. The next one is on mice. This is another study on mice. The next one is not a study. This next one is just a certificate. Next one is not a study. This next one is on rats. Uh, this one just discusses how the preparations are made, not whether they work. These next two studies are about noise injuries and some type of surgical procedure that seems unrelated. Um, and then this next one is uh, a study that was done on roundworms. And the last two are not studies. And then just to really show you the quality of the evidence they're citing, this is, this is one of the mouse studies right here. And not only is it a fucking mouse study, well, you know, you read through it and go, well, what was the procedure for this study? Let's go check, let's go check appendix one. Yeah, it's fucking blank. Protocol, blank. And, and appendix two here, blank. Appendix three, adverse events, blank. Appendix four, blank. Yeah, so I'm gonna go with CMED 100 doesn't do anything either. So while that was pretty convincing, uh, I think if you're looking for a way to waste a bunch of money and potentially inhibit your own fat burning, Prove It is perfect for you, especially if you're a mouse. I don't know if part three is going to be coming out next, but there's going to be a part three on Prove It. I don't know if that'll be the next video or if it'll be like the video after the next one, but we're going to wrap up some of the science there and then we're also going to go back into some of the really shady business partners that are involved because there's even more drama with it. I've been Mac. Peace out. Bye.